Hello, everyone. So, um, first off, this is the first time I do this publicly outside of my company, so I might be a bit nervous, but please be with me. We'll all get to this together. I'm going to show you how we migrated from uh, Becular to Barrios this year. <coughs> but that's a short overview of what we're going to talk about. Mm, yeah, that works. About me. My name is Danny Holcomb, I'm 38, 6 years old. I'm a senior system administrator with Riga Software International in Germany. Uh, my areas of expertise are I'm a Red Hat certified engineer, because my company employs Red Hat almost exclusively. I'm a MySQL DBA, I'm a Mongo DBA. I am responsible for the backup infrastructure, do Python scripting. I had to deal with voice over IP stuff, gladly not so much anymore. <laughs> And of course, more. My company. My company is specialized in software development for the freight forwarding industry. It's been family owned and operated since 1985, which is quite old for an IT company. We have uh, 30 years of experience in forwarding and logistics. We have over 80 employees worldwide. We're located, our main office is located in Dusseldorf, Meerbusch, Germany. And we have branches all over Europe, Asia, and America. I always like to say we're a, a small company, but we have really big customers. So, the mission briefing for the migration. We wanted to rework our backup infrastructure. We've been using Becula for almost 10 years now. The hardware was outdated. The old backup server was, I don't know, six or seven years old, the hardware. Uh, I took this as a good opportunity to switch to Barrios. Um, I wanted to do a major configuration rewrite because uh, over the couple of years I learned a little bit of stuff and I wanted to start fresh and integrate some of the lessons I learned. <laughs> and I wanted to keep the old backups accessible, of course. A little bit of technical details, old hardware, nothing special. We buy Dell, okay. We have a moderately sized boot size. We have a 1.4 uh, terabyte database array attached. We had uh, fiber channel sounds for on disk storage and uh, two drive auto changer with, I don't know, 22 tapes, something like that. Final size of the database was 1.2 terabytes. This is just the Becula database, and this is uh, also, um, this is the database itself after being exported and imported. So there's no overhead of unused space. In the end, there was 470 clients in the database with uh, 10 billion files. Two of our applications, especially the old application, is file-based, and the typical customer system is between 3 and 5 million files, which is quite a lot, I think. And we have lots of unique file names, which are trouble, 1.8 million, uh, billion, billion <laughs> files, and a lot of unique paths. New machine, okay, nothing special there, I think. Quick database, we decided to buy SSDs this time, because for speed. Lots of storage, same auto changer, nothing changed there. This is for the data center in Meerbusch. We also changed the hardware in the data center in Frankfurt. The server there was a bit more recent. Uh, we bought a quite similar system, a new system, a little bit smaller because uh, Meerbusch has to back up all our data centers and Frankfurt just backups Frankfurt and Hong Kong, which is quite small. <coughs> so, the migration plan first test configuration options. What can we do with the new barriers config? What do we want to do? How are we going to do this? Then migrate test and development systems to a new test server, which I didn't have prior to this. I thought it would be a good idea to have one. Then we migrated the data centers, Frankfurt, then Meerbusch, and then Hong Kong. So, dedicated test server. So, just a virtual machine on a Red Hat Enterprise virtualization cluster. 
nothing special. 300 gigabytes allocated. Development systems are usually not that big because they don't hold any real data, just test data. We checked out some new features, the SD to SD migration. Tried out some configuration options, like does our special storage configuration, which I'm going to show you a bit later, still work? How do multiple catalogs work? What about automatic client configuration? Because I was unsatisfied with the way we are doing things. And then make a proof of concept and put it in production on the test server. So how did this turn out? SD to SD copy sadly just works with one director. I did try a little bit with two directors using one database. Does work if you take care of what you're doing. But one director for all data centers was no option for us because if one data center goes away, you cannot do restores in the other. That's really bad, so we prefer to have a director in every data center. Storage configuration still works. Great plus. <laughs> You're going to see why. <clears throat> Multiple catalog feature, yeah, it's in, but it doesn't really work right now, at least not in the way I would like it to be. But well, what can you do? For now, single catalog is the way to go. I wrote a service that handles new clients. I'm going to show that later. Yeah, and then I put it on the test server, and everything turned out to be working quite nicely. Now I'm going to show you some configuration. So I hope you're into configuration for barriers. So, this is our director config. Some time ago, I found out about how to use includes in there, which I think are really great. So, immediately the first thing I did with the new configuration was split everything up in different, in different config files. And uh, since we put our uh, clients in uh, different directories to differentiate between the data centers, I also read the whole directories, cat every config, config files in the directory. And this is all you need for three to 400 clients. I like it. You can see the three different data centers. And then we have some special clients with special configuration that differs from the standard configuration. And uh, I have an extra directory for retired clients, because you should have a strategy about how do you retire clients. This is a sample configuration. This is every client gets one of these files, except if there is special configuration for run script or whatever. And I highlighted the differences between the data centers, which is not much. <clears throat> um, we have quite a high file retention and job retention period, because uh, for compliance reasons, we have to keep our backups for 10 years. We are hosting uh, customs clearing data. and. Uh, Better safe than sorry, you know. <laughs> Every client has two jobs configured. This is the base job for a client, which takes some uh, job defaults. And then we have a copy job, which copies the job to tape. And every client has its own pool. In the old configuration, I had two pools for each client, with a full pool and an incremental pool. But um, I run into problems if you try to run, if you just have, for example, two volumes in the full pool and you try to run more than two full backups in a month, things get, tend to get locked up and don't work anymore and you have to do stuff manually. So we just put everything in one pool and be done with it. I don't care if we do three, four, five full backups in a month. If it's a server which backups a terabyte of data, it is a problem, of course, but this is one of the special cases where I take care that doesn't happen. Yeah, Frankfurt, Hong Kong, just the same. 
Now here's something you might like. This is our file set for every server we have, which is quite simple. I just call a script on the client, which outputs me a list of files or directories it wants to back up. So if you create a new partition, it shows automatically up. You don't need to change the file set. It automatically gets backed up during the next backup run. And if you want to exclude stuff, put a dot backup exclude in a directory you don't want to have backup. Done. I like this one. These are the job defaults. Again, the first one is for Meerbusch, the second one is for Frankfurt. Not much special stuff in there. Well, we use a maximum full interval of 30 days. I do not set explicit dates for full backups, special, except for special client cases, because I don't really care when a full backup is done. It doesn't matter for me. And it doesn't impact production all that much. So I just escaped the hassle and just let it run whenever 30 days are over. I put some stuff in there for uh, duplicate job control because it can happen that the job runs, I don't know, a day, two, three, if it's uh, lots of files in a big file set. So I take care that no duplicate jobs show up, which are quite annoying. And then we have a default copy job for everything. This copies all the clients onto the tape drive, because first we back up to disk, and then we copy everything on tape, which is done over the day, when usually no backups run. As you can see again, Frankfurt is not much different different storage, of course, so we can differentiate between the different data centers. And next up, we have Hong Kong, also the same. And then we have the archive jobs. What we are doing is, um, once we have uh, the jobs on tape, we also want a tape copy for off-site storage. So we run archive jobs that copies all the jobs that are on the one tape, which I call TL, for example, tape library, to an archive storage. And I select the jobs to be copied from those tapes with SQL queries. I've created a table called to archive, where I put in the job IDs that need to be copied. What I do is I run a script every day, this one. It does some SQL magic. <laughs> First, I delete the table, throw everything away because it should be backed up already. Then I select some stuff from the database. Backup jobs and copies that are terminated or with warning. If there's a warning in there, for example, like the file has gone away, I don't care. It's okay. I do this. I split up the two queries. Because if you don't do this in a large database, this query can run for half an hour, an hour. And if I do it this way, it takes less than a second. Mm. And what I noticed is that when you copy from tape to another tape, and you just say uncopy jobs, um, it will only copy jobs that um, have already been removed from the disk drive storage, so that the original copy jobs on the first tapes have been uh, promoted to real backups. And with this query, I catch all the jobs that um, still have a prior copy. I don't know if you can follow this, because it's maybe a bit difficult to understand. <laughs> yeah, then I just put it in the table and the archive jobs reads the table, has a list of jobs to copy, starts the jobs, nice. 
and I also call the pconsole and run the job. That's why the job is not enabled by itself. Okay. This is the pool configuration. As we have seen in the client configuration, every client has its own pool. Then we employ a scratch pool where I put all new tapes. We have uh, the tape library pool with the on-site tape storage, also 10 years of retention. Then we have the archive storage that goes off-site. And we have a separate pool for databases because we don't need to keep databases for more than a month. We pull a, we pull a full backup of the databases once each month to the archive jobs, just so we have an off-site copy. But when the database is 30 days old, you don't really need anything from it, usually. At least I we never had that case. And then you see a little bit of uh, examples of what we have of schedules. As you can see, since I use the f maximum full interval, I have, well, not no, but <laughs> usually no full level defined here. Except for this archive system cycle, we have systems where we keep where we archive customer data or customs data, and uh, the data doesn't really change. It's, it's just archive systems for reference purpose, but we have to keep them, custom paste for them. So we just do a full backup half a year and a differential every month because nothing changes anyway. Just to make sure that the data is still readable. We back them up. So now this is where it gets interesting because this is a kind of configuration you may not have seen before. This is the director storage resource. Tape library, nothing special. It's a two-drive drive changer, so we have two concurrent jobs. And this is the file storage for Merbusch. So you can see we have 10 devices configured, which is maybe unusual, I don't know. This has been running for a couple of years now without any problems. Um, Barrios or Becula, whatever, just uses all those devices. It can, can do 10 concurrent backups on these. And um, every client has its own pool. For, let's, let's take Merbusch as an example. Every client has, a, has its own pool with this storage con, uh, configured. And every client has its own file name, volume name configured, which is the host name, dot, number, whatever. So 10 clients start a backup. Every client has its own file, or its own volume to backup to. So you don't have to configure a storage resource for every client. Everything gets put into one directory, as we're going to see in the storage daemon configuration. We, I, I didn't want to... Um, what you usually do is you have one storage resource and you have one volume in there and lots of clients back up into this one volume. We wanted to have different volumes for each client because then you can... It's much nicer to look at. It's a lot of files, of course but it's much nicer to look at, and uh, you can just uh, delete the files from one client if you don't need them anymore, and do funky stuff. We have a separate storage for copies, so the copies do not interfere with the backups. They can be run in parallel, and they don't take up the devices used for backups. And over there you can see it's the same for Frankfurt and for Hong Kong. For those, we only have two devices because uh, they get back up to a slow network connection anyway, and we don't need 10 writers because it would just overload the network connection. It doesn't make any sense. The storage team configuration. Normal auto-changer configuration. I put in the maximum file size of 20 gigabytes, which was mentioned earlier today. It was a very great article. Very good. <laughs> um, of course, we do spooling. That's why we have separate spool directories. This should be nothing special if you have ever configured an auto changer. 
this is how the devices look. And they're not much different. They have just a number, they have the same media type, they have the same archive device, which points to the same directory, and we have 10 of those. And it works really nicely. <laughs> what can I say? We have the same for the, the other data centers, of course. Also the same. Oh, yeah. And we have separate devices for the copy jobs, as we saw earlier. Again, same media type, same archive device. They just find the volumes and use them. It's that simple. And then... Let's take a look at the automatic client configuration. I wrote a Python script running as a system service. Listens on a network port, TLS encrypted. And when uh, new clients get set up in the Kickstart setup, it automatically contacts the server, passes over the JSON string, client name, password, client type, because we can differentiate between different clients. For example, our the application we provide, uh, we don't need up to back up the whole file system, not the whole operating system. We just back up etc and some more directories that are needed for restore because all the data is in the database anyway. And for the migration, it deactivated the clients on the previous backup server automatically because I had the same client, the same service running on the old server which basically did the same thing in reverse and just said enabled like no in every config file. Small, simple, fast, it worked very nicely during the migration. And now we use it to create new clients, which is just the client configuration templates we saw earlier. It just takes them, does an SED replace client name for uh, the host name of the client, and done. So, we went to deploying this first. We went with the Frankfurt Data Center, because there are less special cases. It automatically updated the configuration in the Meerbusch Data Center, because, of course, Meerbusch is backing up everything from all data centers. In the old configuration, we used one default password for all clients. I thought, yeah, why? We have the opportunity to change this. Every client has its own password now, which is nicer. Then we did the rollout in Meerbusch, also with the automatic config deployment. We just uh, we have a, a configuration RPM, which we install on our servers. And I just made all the changes in there. It deinstalled uh, the Becula client, installed the Barrios client, made configuration changes. Worked twice nicely. And then I had to configure a few clients with special file sets for, for example, our file server. We don't need to back up everything. And uh, there are quite a few links that make, uh, it can happen that it backups some stuff two or three times. And I didn't want that. And we have uh, replication servers where I employed run script to do snapshot of file systems and database backups and stuff. Yeah, and at, at last we went to Hong Kong. No problems whatsoever. I just installed our config RPM. Everything registered automatically. Of course, I had to set up the new backup server first. Oh well. Install the new packages. Put the configuration on there and deploy it. What problems did we run into? Yeah, well, 100 plus full backups over 2 mbit WAN link take quite a while. I was busy a whole week, I think, doing those. Nothing you can do if uh, they don't give you more network bandwidth. I'm quite jealous at uh, <laughs> multiple 10 gigabyte links I saw. <laughs> I'd really like to have that. Multiple exclude dear containing definitions did not work. I submitted 
a bug report, and uh, it was fixed by Marco. Very good. The tape library started to lock up on copy jobs, because uh, initially I tried to, um, from, from the block size article, to implement the changed block sizes. I don't know what happened. It didn't really work. It started to lock up. Marking tapes as unreadable, I don't know what happened. And I didn't... I submitted a bug report, and um, he's waiting for me on an answer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I know, I know. And I'm having trouble because I can only test it on a live server. I have trouble getting time to test it on the live server again because it's doing backups all the time. <laughs> but I just removed it and it works fine without it for me. We're still getting 120 megabytes tape write speed, which is okay for me. Starting copy jobs with a running original backup cost one copy job to be cancelled, the, always the first one. I reported a bug, and after a bit of back and forth with Marco, the bug was fixed. Job well done. And then I noticed that uh, when you copy from tape to tape, because in the script I wrote, I take extra care to order the copy jobs in the order that they are on the tape, so it can just continue reading job after job. But the storage director insisted on... Uh, rewinding the tape every time between every job. Uh, I <laughs> fiddled around a little bit around with C and uh, submitted a patch, but apparently Marco noticed that it breaks something else with encryption, I think, right? Uh, so, um, not quite there yet, but we don't use encryption, so we didn't notice it. My thing is, uh, when, when we do it this way, um, it writes, to, it, it copies from tape to the next tape, and then immediately s starts without rewinding the tape to copy the next job from there, which shaves off about two minutes from each job, which when the copy of the job of like 50 megabytes just takes a few seconds is quite a lot. So, we wanted to keep the old backups accessible. How do we do this? First, I made sure all the jobs have been copied from disk to tape because the fiber channel sounds were going away for sure. And it's okay if they're all on tape. Clear our disk volumes. Only tapes will be left. Then I did a complete database dump of the old database and imported it on the new one into a separate MySQL schema, of, schema, of course. Uh, what I did was I attached the old disk array to the new server, made a link in the MySQL directory to that array, and it's on the same drive, basically. Then I copied the config to an own directory, because yeah, I didn't want to mix up, mix the configuration, configured it a little bit, configured it to a different port, made the correct devices accessible, because I did some renaming and stuff. Uh, we have a separate, we have, besides the tape library, we have a separate LTO5 drive installed for stuff that has been rotated out of the library and now for the old backups as well. Then I wrote a wrapper script that handles uh, the service. Old backup restore, it just starts the director with the old config, starts the B console. Then you can do your restore using the separate LTO5 drive and all the tapes we still have available. And once you're done with the restore, exit, shutdown director, done. Gives us access to uh, four or five years of old backup data, no problem whatsoever. Why do you have to import it to old data to the new database? I didn't import it to the new database, I, put it in, I imported it to a separate schema. But why not to import it to the new database? Ah, okay. Um, because uh, when you have, uh, as I said, we have a 1. terabyte, 1.2 terabyte big database. The database, uh, there's a lot of uh, redundant stuff and old stuff in the database that I didn't want to keep. Like, all the old clients are retired. And I wanted to start with a new, fresh database. 
And uh, I'm going to show you later my ideas, what we can, what, what I thought about this. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, what were the results of all this? We had a smooth transition with only minor bumps. Backup performance, of course, because of the hardware, was greatly improved, re really, by a lot. The configuration was simplified, also by a lot. Uh, I think it shrunk by more than half compared to the old system. And the old backups are still accessible, which is very nice. So. Do you have any questions so far? Uh, you can do it both ways because most of our users don't really have access to the system themselves, just to the applications on top. Um, when I see something or my colleagues see something that we don't really need to back up because it's redundant or just scratch data that you're going to throw away anyway, we just exclude the directory. The experience we have with uh, users, they tend to uh, um, see their data more important than anything else. They don't use that. Yeah. Yeah, um, our, our users don't really know about the file, so. Uh, you mentioned uh, multiple catalogs. Yeah. Can you tell about what use cases? Yeah, um, of course. Um, we have uh, th three different applications that we uh, run. Um, the old application, which is, as I said, file-based with three to five million files for each instance. I wanted to put that in a separate database because it's a lot of unique file names. We have a clearing center that does customs clearing and Cargo 2000 and other stuff in that directory, which is basically, uh, it, it creates about 500,000 to a million f unique files a day that are deleted after two weeks and that is really not good for the backup. That's how we got so many unique file names that I wanted to put in another database and then have a database for all the rest of the clients with the normal data, just to um, have it easily, to be easily managed. Um, yeah, it doesn't, if, if you want to have one client just in one database, just in one catalog, that doesn't work. If you define a pool and do not, hard link it to the catalog, it appears in all catalogs. It, yeah, it didn't really work, at least not the way I wanted it to work. I wanted to have a clear distinction between that and not have one client in all three catalogs, but it wasn't possible to do it that way. So I just thought, okay, nothing we can do. We'll do it differently. <laughs> More questions? Yes. Yeah. I use the old configuration of Perios. The nice thing uh, about if, even if you if you want to make great and keep the old database, Barrios is a plug-in replacement. You can just switch out the packages and the configuration should just work, which is quite nice. Yes. Yeah, what, what you, yeah, what you, what you could basically do is uh, you just deinstall the Bacula packages, put on the barriers packages, the 13.2 or the 14.2, and 
and uh, everything should just work. Of course, um, yeah, you, c you can just keep on using the configuration, I think. Yeah. At least I didn't have to do any major changes for the old one. It's uh, completely compatible, which is really, really nice. Okay, we have more. Okay, sorry. <laughs> No, no, we, 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 just, we just keep the tape as is. Tapes as is. We're not going to touch them anymore. Uh, we're not really going to delete them. I think we're just going to recycle or... Um, yeah, yeah. yeah no, we, we're, just gonna, we're not going to uh, do a retention. We're just going to keep them. And after 10 years, we uh, can just um, destroy the tapes. Because we're not going to need it anymore. Yeah. No, we don't. Yeah, we just throw them away in a secure way. <laughs> Some data destruction company, whatever. We did it with uh, the prior DLT tapes as well. The company that take all the tapes, threw them in a big hack thing. Yeah. yeah, 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 that's what you would do normally. But uh, in my case, um, I've always thought about that. When we get to that point after 10 years, um, the tapes will be purged from the database, but we're just going to keep the tapes. So if we ever going to need them again, we just can scan them again with B-Scan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing I noted during my tests was um, on the old database, building a restore tree. You know, for the interactive restore, when you go into the tree, took quite a while. I did some tests, and uh, I didn't take the time on the old my, on the MySQL 5.1. I didn't really take the time, but uh, the building the restore tree took upwards of two hours for a file set of three million files. Just because the file table is 800 gigabytes, I think. It's quite big. And then I thought, okay, I took a look at the query, and since it's in the code, you can't really change it. And uh, it uses subqueries. And so I thought, okay, well, MySQL 5.5 changed a lot in subquery optimization. So I went and installed Percona Server 5.5 because for our database setup, we've been looking at Percona for quite a while and we plan to switch to Percona. So I installed it on the backup server as a slight test case. What happened is uh, building of the restore tree now takes between five and 10 seconds compared to upwards of two hours just because of the MySQL version change from 5.1 to 5.5. MySQL subquery optimization. <laughs> Wild stuff. I have something more for you, yes. Um, since the incrementals are not that big, when we're doing full backups, they may take a couple of hours. But um, we, usually they're done within two, three hours, everything. Has that ever kept uh, the system taking standard backups because they weren't finished yet? The trick is um, the way I configured the storage is the copy jobs do not block the storage devices that are used for backing up. So the copy jobs can run, use their two storage devices. And there are still 10 storage devices available for doing backups. You're, you're pulling them from display, 
Yeah. I do have tape to tape. Um, where do spooling? And yes, that takes a little bit longer, especially when we copy like uh, the biggest one we have is some 900 gigabytes. Um, not standard backup, just copy jobs. But the copy jobs run beforehand. Okay, so whenever the copy jobs, uh, copy job starts, it lets in the higher prioritized uh, standard backups. Uh, no, um, I have uh, enough concurrent jobs on a director to do everything at once. I just limit it. Um, I limit it by the capabilities of the storage resource. So um, there on the tape library only have two concurrent jobs. And when it runs an archive job, it can only do one job at a time because it uses both tape drives, of course. And um, now I lost my trail of thought. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we 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 do a. Um, I use a tool called My Dumper, which does parallel dumping of parallel tables, more than one table at once, and it doesn't really take that long. About two hours to just put them into files, and the files themselves, when zipped, are about four or five hundred gigabytes, so about half, which is not that bad. Backing up the uh, MongoDB servers is uh, quite worse because I just do a file system snapshot and copy the files. I could do a, 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 a complete dump, but uh, I didn't try around this. No. no. That would be, uh, yes, on to disk, yes but I don't uh, back up it separately. Also, the database is um, replicated to the other data centers. So uh, the only big real problem would be me messing up dropping the database or dropping a table. And that hopefully will never happen again. <coughs> <laughs> so I have something for you about retiring clients. So how do you retire clients? A quick and dirty is you just delete the volumes, delete the configuration files, be done with it. Out of the configuration, out of sight, okay. That's quick, but you cannot do any further restores. There are artifacts in the database. The pool, the client, the file set. Still in the database, because that does not get deleted if you don't do it yourself. And if the backups are on tape, using bscan to recreate the volumes leads to an error, because bscan suddenly says, yeah, I don't know this client. And Exit. That's it. So, what do we do? We retire them and keep them available. That's why I have a separate directory for retired clients. Make sure all jobs have been copied to tape. Delete all the on-disk volumes, which promotes the copies automatically full backups. You disable the jobs for the client, and then you move the config to a directory for the retired clients. Restore is still possible because everything is still available. B-scan catalog recreation still works, but of course it takes a little bit more space on the database side, and the configuration can get very big over the years, because you have to keep all the old clients. This is the main reason why I wanted to start fresh with the migration. And here I have uh, another concept I've been thinking about, and I think I will do this. Cycle the database. The database can get really big, in our case. What can we do? We can retire it and keep it available. Same, make sure all jobs have been copied to tape. You delete the on-disk volumes. You copy the complete config to a retirement directory, for example, BarOS 2014. You rename the database, adjust the config file, and then I extend my script that starts a separate director and accesses the database to also offer restores from that year. So we have all the old stuff from the old server, and then we have three restores for 2014. Pro is you start with a clean database each year. Retired clients get removed. You don't have to keep in your, them in your configuration. Database storage requirements, of course, increase because you have to keep all the old stuff, and once you start 
with the new database, the same file names, the same paths are in there. But you can move the old database to slower storage. And restoring is cumbersome. You cannot just start B console and restore something from the past year. I've been toying around with this idea, and um, sin since we have so many unique files that are never used again, this is something that we are going to do. But just some maybe this is something to think about. I don't know. And that's it. Thank you.